All right, uh, coming up, we'll be talking to Shane Jones, uh, New Zealand first number two, and very much the Omanons Greece um, of the National Party. Oh, sorry, of New Zealand first. Um, Shane was a former New Zealand, uh, a former Labour Party cabinet minister, ran into a bit of trouble, um, but nonetheless has managed to successfully vault himself back, um, became a Minister of Regional Development with a $3 billion slush fund. That was pretty cool. Wouldn't mind one of those myself. Uh, called the Provincial Growth Fund. Was it $3 billion or $1 billion? I can't remember. I'll ask him in a second. Uh, but he is number two on the New Zealand First list. And um, there are eight New Zealand First MPs. Andy Foster, the former Mayor of Wellington, is one of them. Um, it goes down to Tanya uh, Ankovic, uh, who is, well, you'll meet, get to meet her, but there are lots of new names amongst all the MPs who are elected on Saturday night. Um, and they will be also nervously waiting until the 3rd of November. And as I said, the incredible thing is that the Electoral Commission has managed to stuff it up so brilliantly. We've had two censuses stuffed up by bureaucrats in Wellington. We've now had this election stuffed up by the Electoral Commission. We should not have to wait until the 3rd of November until we finally get a composition of our cabinet. Everybody knew, um, and of our coalition, everybody knew since 1996 that coalitions are required, um, the last election being an absolute exception, but coalitions are required to form governments. You get onto this process really quickly. Never in the history of MMP in this country um, has it taken so long to get to a final result. And I'm stunned still. I've seen the explanations offered as to why it's taking so long. I'm stunned that people accept those explanations. Um, it is just an absolute travesty. And good God, we live in 2023. We're meant to have all this modern technology. It's meant to make things easier. No proof of that at the moment. Uh, anyhow, uh, whether or not they're in or not, uh, what the council, what the um, specials will finally decide and determine, um, you've seen the sort of uh, reluctance um, of David Seymour repeated again this morning on that particular issue. But joining us to talk about, well, the whole campaign really, the New Zealand First perspective, were they happy on or were they disappointed on election night? What does the future hold? Um, is the ineffable uh, uh, Northland New Zealand First number two, Shane Jones, and he joins us now. Shane, thank you so much for joining us. Lovely to have you on the show. Yeah, morning. Kia ora, folks. Great to be here. Um, where are you? Are you back in the north or you're in Wellington still? No, 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 in the head of the fish, mate. Oh, okay. So you're up there. Um, oh, sorry, in the head of the fish. Does that mean you're in Wellington? <laughs> yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm in the capital. How long are you staying there for, Shane? Oh, no, no. Heading home tomorrow. Um, our new caucus members arrived in town I think on Monday night so as one of the more experienced members of the caucus I d it was determined that Shane can you come down and start to reassure the people that have uh, just taken on this role that um, it's not as easy as you might think and ensure that parliamentary services when they provide their briefing don't seek to clone the new MPs because the MPs at the end of the day are not employees of parliamentary services. They're responsible to both the party and the wider electorate. Now, I'm glad you've raised that issue because parliamentary services like to think they're in charge like all bureaucrats do and you'll meet there. At the end of the day, um, they're meant to be there to service the elected members, yeah? I don't think it's just parliamentary services. I think uh, you and I are of a similar vintage. Matt, I was born in 1959. In my lifetime, we've seen the rise, and I believe it's a key feature as to why Labour has failed so miserably. Politicians have lost the ability, have lost um, the confidence to control the bureaucracy. Yeah. And nowhere is that more evident, and it pains me as a politician of Māori descent to see how far this treaty virus has got into uh, the bloodstream of the bureaucracy and it's going to require some pretty robust treatment to put it back where it belongs. Yeah, and, and one of the issues though goes back to right from the start though, it was the political failure, wasn't it Shane, not to define what the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi were in the first place. To leave it to the courts and to bureaucrats to be able to take that power upon themselves. That was a failure, hasn't it been, of successive governments? Well, it was Geoffrey Palmer who 
who did several things. Geoffrey Palmer in 1985 enabled the Waitangi Tribunal to move back to examining grievances back to 1840. And then secondly, Geoffrey Palmer inserted into the SOE Act a rather ironic place, which was designed mm. to restructure the state and lead to the privatisation. He inserted into that piece of legislation a reference to the pr tr principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. And then that in 1987 led to the historic Lord Cook decision. And I recall Richard Pribble many, many years ago lamenting the fact that he never stopped Geoffrey from doing that. So once that process begun, mate, um, politicians uh, have gone along for the ride and probably have been focused on trying to resolve um, historic property right uh, related grievances. And New Zealand First understands because we really are, a, a, not only are we a patriotic party, but we're a property right party as well. However, um, the Waitangi Tribunal has continued and worsened uh, the viralisation of the treaty because it's now looking at the tax system, constitutionalism, self-government, which is why our party passed a resolution at our AGM earlier this year uh, to disestablish the Waitangi Tribunal or grossly curb its mandate. Mm, OK. Um, well, on that issue, all power to you in actual fact. And one of the things that struck me, Shane, um, uh, and I can tell you that my wife voted for you, um, and that is for New Zealand first rather than you, obviously she doesn't live in your seat, um, was um, because in good part she felt that New Zealand first would be required on issues like that to put pressure on what is a centrist government who, and that is the National Party, who, don't, who won't necessarily move on that issue, will they? I don't know who they've got in mind to replace um, Christopher Luck, uh, not Christopher Luxon, what's the other fellow's name? Finlayson. Christopher Finlayson was the treaty minister in Key's time, so I've no idea uh, who and how the Tories are thinking about that. But we've reached a tipping point in the sense that over the last three years, the government turbocharged a unit in the government called the Arafiti, which is analogised to a bridge between um, the Pakeha population and the Crown and Māori and anyway, all sorts of uh, all sorts of fanciful analogies. Uh, that organisation, I, I hardly see why it should continue to exist. I don't know how much money it consumes, but we cannot allow the continual injection. Of, these, of this treaty virus into the bloodstream of the bureaucracy, it has to be held accountable by the political system. Mm. Mm. Oh, you're not going to get an argument from me on that. In fact, um, can I just to augment what you said about uh, Richard Preble and um, Geoffrey Palmer? When I asked Mike Moore the same question, uh, when we were having some chats together, and this was, gosh, the mid-1990s, Shane, um, Geoffrey Palmer, when he also tackled, he said Geoffrey Palmer over what the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi meant um, as they were sitting around the cabinet table. Mike Moore said that Geoffrey Palmer said to him, don't worry, mate, it's just window dressing. So, mm, yeah, I think I think, Mike, I think, Mike, you've got to go a bit deeper. You've got to remember that Geoffrey was a great supporter of a supreme constitution. Mm. And you may remember he was greatly taken by Lord Hailsham's famous book, Elective Dictatorship. And Geoffrey was always a believer that we needed a Bill of Rights and the Bill of Rights needed to be supreme law that people could appeal to in order to strike down parliamentary legislation. And I rather think Geoffrey's philosophical approach to constitutional issues back then also informed his view of the treaty that it should be supervised by the courts and not left to the ebb and flow of politics. Um, he may not have said it at the time, but when you look at the guy's philosophical approach to how you curb the uh, conduct of the civil service or you, how, how you limit the uh, capacity of uh, parliamentarians to pass legislation, he was very taken in those days by that American model where you could appeal to a supreme constitution. Well, that's not the New Zealand Westminster system.